so thank you for um, coming and attending our webinar. Uh, my name is Vincent. Um, I am joined by my colleague Sophie and um, our, our uh, friends, if I can call it, Kate from uh, the Green Blue. Um, so I will start by introducing myself. Um, I work for um, Globe Sailor. I've been a charter advisor at Globe Sailor for the last two years. Um, we uh, work on the English speaking markets. Um, we with um, we will today talk about um, sustainable boating and uh, mindful ecosystems um, and be mindful of ecosystems and the environment uh, during your sailing trips. Um, so the webinar should last about one hour overall. We will allocate 45 minutes to the presentation and uh, 15 minutes for your questions uh, at the end. Feel free to um, drop us some questions uh, down here in in the um, in the uh, chat bar at the bottom, uh, we will take notes of the questions, try and answer them in real time if we can. Um, otherwise, we'll take note of them and try and answer as many as possible um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, just a, a note to uh, all of you, you are all muted. So if you're having breakfast and doing some other things on the sides, uh, don't worry, it's not going to interfere with the audio. Um, you can just keep going with uh, what you're doing and um, and listen to the presentation. Um, so, Sophie, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and Globe Sailor? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sophie. I've been with the company um, since this year. And I just wanted to tell you a bit more about Globe Sailor. We have been in the yacht charter industry for the past 15 years. Um, our goal is to um, make it easy as possible for everyone to find the best boat. Um, we do that by working in seven, in more than seven different languages. Um, we offer our services and we also are partnered with over 1,000 renters. Um, because we're in the yacht charter industry, we do recognize how important it is um, to um, be mindful of sustainable boating. And so we wanted to um, put this together here with Kate to educate all of you on how to, um, to be more responsible when sailing. So um, Kate, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, would love to have you tell a bit more about yourself and about the Green Blue. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, um, you guys, for inviting me um, to do the, the webinar. Um, and it was great meeting you um, at Southampton Boat Show, where we first met. Um, and you came along to a few, a few of the talks I was delivering, and we built, built a great friendship. So great, great bunch of people behind the scenes at Globe Sailors. Um, and, and thank you for all your support. Um, just to you. give you a background, you. Um, you may not be familiar with the Green Blue, but hopefully by the end of this webinar, you will. But you'll probably be more familiar with the R way. Um, the R way's actually just gone for a new branding. So this is the new logo you can see here. So if it looks slightly unfamiliar. Um, but essentially, the Green Blue is the environmental awareness program for the Royal Yachting Association. Um, and actually, it was set up back in 2005. So we've been around for a while. And my role at the Green Blue is I manage the program and I sit within a sustainability team at the Royal Yachting Association. Um, as part of that team, the team is making the RA and its events more sustainable. But the Green Blues role is to raise awareness of key environmental issues that are associated with recreational boating. And that's to support um, individual boaters, clubs, centres and also businesses as well in helping them to make more sustainable choices. Um, we do have a website where um, lots of information, including the topics that I'm going to be covering in the webinar, you can find. We do have lots of different topics we cover, and I won't be able to cover them all um, today, but please go on the website um, and you'll be able to find things um, um, that you may have some queries or questions around that I won't have time to cover. Um, if you want to drop me an email, you can go to info um, uh, at thegreenblue.org.uk. Um, all those emails come through to our team and then we'll try our best to answer those. So if your questions don't get answered at the end or during, that's a great opportunity for you. So sustainable boating. As sailors, we have the fortune of being able to go and visit some amazing places around the world. And many of you that are on the webinar now, the reason you're probably here is because you know that where you're going and doing your boating is beautiful and that you want to make sure that you're protecting it. 
And I think to be able to go and visit some of these amazing places, what do we get out of it? Um, for me personally, um, it's my well-being, my health and enjoyment. And just being immersed in this kind of beautiful scenery. And that's really why I got into um, environmental um, career, if you like, or interest was actually the sports I was doing out on the water. And I wanted to make sure that anything I was doing in those environments, that I was protecting those. And I hope that you resonate with that and, and feel the same. And that's why I'm really keen to be able to share with you some examples of what you can do when you're out on the water. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, I always love listening to you speak. Um, as you mentioned, it was so lovely to hear you talk about um, the, the panel you talked about at the Southampton Boat Show. Um, so could you just tell us a bit more about how sailors can minimize their environmental impact while provisioning um, before the sailing holiday? Yeah, so of course, before we even get onto the boats, um, what can we be packing in our bags? What we can we be considering um, to try and minimize our impact? I mean, the first thing, big thing, which is probably really, really difficult, is trying not to fly to these places in the first place and maybe going cross country, extending your trip a little bit, getting a train journey um, or maybe um, gathering people all in, in a vehicle and heading somewhere um, is far better than flying. But some of these beautiful places, unfortunately, are more remote um, and then we do have to go through that. But there are things that we can do on board. So. In terms of when you're at home, you're considering what am I going to be putting into my um, kit when I take away? Obviously, you won't be able to carry huge amounts um, if, if you're going further afield. But these are some tips um, that I'd like to share with you. So first of all, the first thing is you've got your wash bag. The wash bag itself actually could be made out of recycled sailcloth or recycled polyester. And there are companies that are doing that. So that's your first thing. And then what's going in there? Cleaning products. When we're on board these vessels, a lot of our grey water, things that are going down the sink, in our showers, or even when we're out on deck washing our hair with salt water and all the rest of it, if you're using cleaning products, a lot of that will be going straight out into our waters. And therefore, we need to be looking at can we improve in what we're buying there and actually be buying more natural ingredient based um, cleaning products. There's lots on the market these days, um, so there are the options available, but the key thing here is natural ingredients. Um, obviously, if you're chartering, you're not going to be providing a lot of the cleaning products on board, but I would strongly recommend, and I'll be saying this throughout the webinar, if you're on a charter holiday, please do mention to the company or whoever's on the boat, um, if you're getting um, a boat where it's already got a skipper on board or crew, do mention, oh, are you using eco-friendly cleaning products on board? Do you have this? Do you have that? Um, because it's worth as a customer asking these questions and that will plant the seed in these companies going, actually, we could be doing things better and improving. So it's very much a two-way thing. The other things when we're looking at um, um, products that we might be um, cleaning ourselves with, but also on board is microplastics. Now, some of these products have exfoliants in, which are small beads of plastic, um, in the UK, that's been stopped now, but um, further afield, it might be a different story. So one thing to look out in for in the ingredients list is polyethylene. That means it's got some form of plastic in there. So the poly is the, the polymer. So it's a really good thing, thing to look out for. Um, other things are sun creams. When we're using sun cream, we're trying to protect our skin. But a lot of these sun creams have chemicals in them and can have metals in as well, such as zinc, because zinc reflects the sunlight and the UV rays. The problem there is if it does enter the water when we go for a lovely swim off our vessels, um, if there's lots of that activity happening in an area and that's popular with boating and also bathers on the beach, then that can actually start coating some of our plants and corals. And that one has a toxic impact on them. But if they rely on photosynthesizing um, or that UV light to survive, that um, the chemicals in the sun cream are going to block that. So really important to start looking at our sun creams and can we get some alternatives. Now, savethereef.org is a great website to go to and it provides you with some of those options that you can go and have a look at and a bit more about the chemicals that you might find in your sun creams, which actually can be quite harmful for your skin as well. So it's not only the environmental health, it's us as well. Um, other things are making sure that we're taking refilling bottles. Don't buy brand new ones. Get some refillable little um, containers for your shampoos um, and making sure that you're refilling those from larger containers. 
Um, obviously, if you're going abroad and it's not your own vessel, then you're probably going to be doing those smaller options as well. But try not to buy new, keep your same refills and then refill them from your larger eco-friendly cleaning products at home. Avoid single-use plastic. So I know how tempting it is to get those wet wipes because you think, right, I'm going to be on board. I can't use much water. I want to feel fresh. Um, wet wipes is going to be the way forwards. They have plastics in a lot of them. And even if it says they're biodegradable, they're only really biodegradable in industrial process. Um, so if you're using those and you think they're going to break down in a short amount of time, they will not. Um, so please, no, no on wet wipes. I know that's going to be really hard for some of you, but try and get a flannel, get some water, take that to the bathroom with you, rinse down with that. And, and the best thing to save water is rinse with salt water first, sorry, wash with salt water, then rinse with fresh water afterwards. Um, another note I want to say there, um, in terms of toilet paper, I will mention this later on though, um, if you do end up having to pack your own toilet paper to take, um, a lot of toilet paper has glue in it. And if that goes down the heads, um, including wet wipes, it will block them. Um, you can get alternatives now, which don't have the glue in inside. Um, please feel free to email me um, if you want to find out more about what those options are. Um, again, kit that we're wearing. If you don't go on lots of sailing holidays all the time, maybe a couple of times a year and you don't do much at home, then try borrowing somebody else's jackets, clothing, try and get second hand. Um, our ambassadors, so a couple of them um, who are actually originally based down in Falmouth, they're out in the Mediterranean at the moment. So these are the green blue ambassadors they are on a fully electric yacht and they're, they're trying to be as sustainable as possible. Um, they've actually gone to marinas sometimes and looked in the bins and found brand new jackets, you know, great gear to wear. So that just goes to show you people are sort of throwing things away and only using them once. Um, go to local charity shops, especially if you're in a sailing area. If you go in there, you're probably going to find some good, good kit. Um, and if you have to buy something new, try and make sure it's made out of uh, sustainable materials, recycled polyester. There's some great companies out there at the moment taking waste um, plastic, even from the oceans, and creating new clothing from it. Or like I said earlier, with the um, sailcloth, people are making all sorts of things from that as well. So that's your wash kit and, and some of your luggage. Just a few little tips. Um, to help you with alternative products of what you could take on board, and if some of you own your own vessels, then we have the Green Blue Business Directory, and we set this up to list more environmentally sustainable products and services for boat users. So it's a tool to enable you um, to do the best you can. We're um, going forwards, we've got some exciting plans around this, and we're going to be building it, and it's going to become more comprehensive. But just to give you some examples, You've got things on there like electric outboard engines, really, really popular at the moment for decarbonization, inboard, electric inboard, sustainable clothing alternatives, sail, sail cloth made out of recycled polyester, the clothing, the cleaning products, water and bilge filters. Now there's some things on here which I'm not covering in this webinar because it's more about if you're going to charter a vessel, but if you own your own vessel, there's so many good devices that you can start putting on board. Kate, we have a we have a couple of questions that came up in the in the chat. Um, yeah. um, I'd like to uh, remind everyone that, uh, of course, if you've got any um, detailed questions about certain products or or anything, feel free to write to Kate. We've just popped in the email again in the chat. Kate, I just wanted to know um, what's your take on uh, dry shampoo? Dry shampoo, um, so the kind of powdery stuff you put in your hair. So again, it's looking at the ingredients with that um, and finding out what the contents is. Um, if it's not got natural ingredients in there, which I suppose, um, then, then I would recommend not using it. Um, I would go for your more natural ingredients. Um, some people, someone's mentioned on here also soap bars and not using plastic, great idea. Um, yes, I know it's hard and some of us what have these behaviors that we want to be using certain products to make our life easier, but we need to start thinking about OK, is that going to enter the environment? How is it going to get in there? Is it something I can do? So you might be putting the dry shampoo on. And that might be fine because it's not going straight into the water. But when you come to wash that, where is that going? If you're at a marina and you're using onshore facilities, then hopefully that should be going to a sewage works um, to be treated. And I always say try and use those onshore facilities. Um, otherwise, everything we're washing, even the eco-friendly cleaning products, they're still products that are going to enter the water. 
Um, we don't really want to be putting anything additional that's not natural um, into our waterways. So, so that would be that would be my answer for that. Okay, yeah, definitely. And there's more and more shops nowadays that offer uh, eco-friendly alternatives. So feel free to check them out wherever you are. Um, I'm sure you'll be able to find them easily. Kate, uh, moving on, how can sailors ensure their responsibility um, when disposing the waste products and minimise what goes down the sink and uh, into the waste tank while they're sailing? Yeah, so, so we've kind of touched on a little bit of this already. So it's definitely looking at the cleaning products um, that we're using on ourselves, but also to wash the dishes. Um, if you go on a charter company, again, if they've got cleaning products already, just check out, check them out. Um, do they contain phosphate, chlorine and bleach? Do, do you think they're quite harmful? Um, maybe suggest them to buy some alternatives. And like I said, on the Green Blue Business Directory, we've got some examples um, that you can maybe suggest um, to those companies. If you arrive and there's pretty much nothing on board and it's up to you to go and buy these things, then if you're going to, please use eco-friendly cleaning products. Um, like I said, it's going to go straight out into the water and we want to be avoiding that um, wherever we can. Um, other things are actually how we're cooking on board as well. Um, um, some of our ambassadors are complete vegans and vegetarians and actually that really suits them because they're not having all this fat and oil which are then gonna to have to think, where am I gonna dispose of this? It's either gonna go down the piping and block it up or go straight out into the environment. Um, and again, you're gonna to have to get something, some cleaning products there to really get it off. Um, the example in a picture here, this is just one of the um, providers, EcoWorks. Um, there's a perception that these eco-friendly cleaning products don't work very well, they do. Um, and these ones, instead of using these phosphates um, and highly alkaline detergent type base, they use enzymes, which are natural things that, that occur in our body. It's what breaks down our food in our stomach. The same thing happens with these cleaning products. These enzymes are breaking down the dirt. Um, so it's a more natural form of it. Um, and just in this picture here, actually, you can see um, this is a um, photograph of um, one of our ambassadors' um, vessels. And they're using um, more sustainable cleaning products to actually wash up with. So again, yeah, you've got your soap bar there. Um, you, they're using the, um, scourers made out of more sustainable materials, more natural materials rather than plastic, um, plastic ones or plastic based. So that's really good. Um, in terms of toilets, black water. Now, these are our recommendations. Um, so please use onshore straight away it's going to the sewage works um so if you're um, paying for a nice berth at a marina utilize that money you're paying and go and use their lovely facilities i know it's probably a little bit of a trek down the pontoon but that means it's all going to get treated and it's not going straight into the marina um, or into your local waters um, where it's going to have bacteria such as e coli and if you've got bathing waters nearby um, you've got people swimming in it um, and also a lot of marinas these days will have a policy of no um, no discharge in their marina. However, if you're out in a lovely cove and bay um, and, you know, um, on our chart holidays, it's really looking about where are we discharging? Now, if you've got a good charter company and again, ask them this, do they have a holding tank on board? Some countries, it is a legal requirement. Other countries, it is not, like the UK. So it's worth asking, is there a holding tank on board? And if they say no, then say, well, this I think is really important to me as a customer. But if you do have a holding tank, that means you can hold on to your sewage until you either find a pump out facility on shore to pump it out, or you can hold on to it until you are away from a bathing beach or a sensitive environmental area. And we usually recommend three nautical miles off the coastline. I know that's not always possible in some locations, um, but a lot of people will come back and say, oh, well, there's not enough pump out facilities along the coast. So what's the point of me installing a holding tank or even using it? The point is it holds onto it until you're away from those sensitive areas. And um, if you've been lucky enough to be on a charter holiday where, you know, you're in a cove and you're staying overnight and, you know, you go for a swim in the morning or during the day, and there's other boats around. What's going into the water there? Cleaning products from people having showers, people going to the toilet, people cooking on board, cleaning. We're swimming in it, it ourselves, but other people might be enjoying the environment as well. And it can also have an impact on our wildlife um, and our habitats. 
So holding tank, really, really important. If you don't have a holding tank, like I said, as far away as you can, use the toilets um, away from the bathing beaches and those sensitive habitats. I know you might get caught short and we can't always ensure that, but just think about these things in the back of your head. And then that last thing I said, please do not put toilet paper um, down the heads and wet wipes, especially if you have um, holding tanks, um, because it will block the pump out systems up and they break. And then what we find is boaters ring up the green blue and go, oh, we've gone to this marina that has a pump out facility, but it's broken. It's been broken for months. That's because people are using wet wipes um, and misusing the heads and maybe not experienced enough in how to use those. Um, but also, if they're going straight out into the water, you've got toilet paper, which, again, has got that glue in and chemicals and wet wipes. Like I said, they do not break down. You're, you're contributing to the plastic um, issue there. Have a little bag in the toilet. Put the tissues in there. I know you might feel uncomfortable about that, but have it in a black bag, something which you can't see that will seal up. Um, and then when you're on shore, you can take that on shore and dispose of it. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, we had a really interesting question actually about um, yes. certifications. Um, do you have any tips on recognizing which products are eco-friendly? You know, sometimes it's hard to know. Um, any, I, I know you have the one that you recommend, um, but any any tips on on that? Um, so, like I said, we've got the Green Blue Business Directory. Go on there because there are some cleaning products available. We are looking to make that comprehensive, but the way we assess it is quite difficult because the companies have to provide um, a data sheet which tells you what chemicals are in there, but also how they're testing them. So sometimes you find out they're testing them still on animals. And if, you, if you're not happy with that, um, but you won't know until you ask the companies for their data sheets and actually start reading in and they're quite lengthy. What we tend to do is ask for a third party um, um, in accreditation to affirm that it is environmentally friendly. And if not, then we have to make sure that they're using enzyme based um, and natural products. Um, and then if not, then we can't recommend them. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you so I, much. I can't list lots of um, brand names and things because we're not in a situation where there is a few, there's a lot available. Maybe maybe in a private email, so do, do feel free to email. Yes, of course, thank you. Um, we'd like to ask a bit more about wildlife now. Um, so what are the key considerations and practices um, when boating around wildlife just to ensure their safety and well-being? Yeah, so if you had the amazing pleasure to experience the amazing wildlife we get to view when we're out on our vessels, there might be dolphins that are riding the bow wave, it might be a flock of birds in the air or even on the water as well. It could be a seal haul out um, or in the bottom picture here, you know, beautiful orcas, um, you know, passing us by. But how can we make sure that we minimise our disturbance on these species? We're entering their habitat, essentially. So um, we need to respect that. And the other thing is, if we could, if we'd continue disturbing and there's lots of boating happening in an area, it will change the behavior of these species and they won't return. And for us, we won't then get to see them. Hence the slow down, disturb less, see more. Um, this is a great diagram here, um, which we use often because it helps you to understand um, if you do want to go and view wildlife, you know, we're curious, we want to witness these things, then there is appropriate ways of doing that. So if you do spot wildlife in the distance, and by all means, just don't, don't go anywhere near it, continue on your route, of course. Um, if you are have this very strong temptation, you need to have a look around you and say, is there a lot of other boats here that are maybe crowding this species and looking? Is it right for me and my vessel to contribute towards that and crowd? Um, especially if there's a species that's probably getting hemmed against the coastline and it has no way of escaping. Just have that second thought in your head of, do I want to contribute to all this? Can I come back later? Um, if you are approaching wildlife, it, looking at the diagram, you need to come in at a 45 degrees angle and you need to keep 100 metres away and then come away slowly. Never approach from behind because it's seen as predatorial and, and that creates fear and will scare that species in the water or above the water as well. Never approach from the front because that's aggressive and attacking and that will, that will cause disturbance in the species. And what's difficult is when you do look at a species, 
um, you don't know if it's going through stress. There are sometimes telltales, especially with seals, their heads will go up and they will look at you and they'll look around. That's the first thing, they're looking at you and they're waiting for your next move. That's telling you don't go any closer because they're watching you. Um, and if they start to move, they're trying to escape into the water where they feel most safe. Um, so you just be very wary of that. Um, get some binoculars out, take some binoculars with you. <laughs> Um, view from a distance, um, don't overcrowd. And sometimes we can't avoid wildlife coming towards us. Um, so a lot of you might be thinking, well, as if a pile of dolphins comes up to me, what am I supposed to do? Let them ride the bow wave, but keep a consistent direction with your vessel. Slow down a little bit, okay? Because you might have a risk of collision and it gives you more time to think as a skipper and understand what's going on. Um, and let them leave you on their terms and do not follow. OK, so, so they're the key things there. Um, but we, we know that dolphins do like to ride the wave if you're going at a certain speed. Other species may not. Um, and also we've got different species of dolphins. Some are curious and come up to our vessels. Others do not like to be near. So you don't think, oh, there's a pod of dolphins over there. Right. I'm going to head over because they love riding my bow wave you don't know if that's the same sort of species um, that enjoys doing that. So that's that's something else to, to bear in mind there. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, it's true that everyone's always a bit curious to go and see you a bit more, but um, having that second thought mm -hmm. and approaching the animals um, mm -hmm. in a very respectful manner, that's that's very important. And and um, our panel seems to completely agree with you. So um, so thanks for reminding us on the good practices uh, with uh, with with wildlife. So could um, could you tell us uh, what techniques and tools um, uh, sailors can use to anchor properly when they get to their anchorage point? Uh, if they were to drop the anchor to minimize the impact on the sensitive um, habitats on the, that are linked to the seabed. Um, of course, and uh, avoiding damaging um, uh, what uh, some species call home. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, the Green Blues and the RWA as a whole is part of a really exciting project called the Remedies Project. It is UK based, but it's um, looking at restoring and protecting sensitive seabed habitat. And one of those is seagrass, but we've also got reefs um, in other countries really important sensitive habitats and they usually exist a lot of them in the places that we like to go and visit because seagrass um, in particular grows in sheltered bays and coves and that's a perfect spot for us to go and anchor in so we've really got to think of how we're compromising and balancing here to help ensure that we're protecting these habitats but still maintaining our freedom of access um, and enjoyment we get um, so as part of this project, um, the Green, Blue and the RWA have been raising awareness of these habitats um, amongst the recreational boating community and then providing best practice around anchoring technique. But we've also been looking at these new technologies around advanced eco mooring systems. So instead of our usual swing moorings or um, anchoring, we use these other moorings which are designed to minimise disturbance on the seabed. But um, I'll, ex I'll explain a little bit more about that shortly. So just give me an idea, you can see in the images, we've got seagrass on the left here, and you'll find lots of that in the Mediterranean all around the country. And yes, there is some in the UK. Um, and although the, the waters are a little bit more murky, but if you go down to the Isles of Scilly, you can see it's a 10 meter depth. Um, so it's a whole different story, but there's some beautiful stuff down there. Um, the, the reason we've kind of really focused on seagrass and it's very popular at the moment is because it's such a great carbon store. It's helping to tackle climate change. In the UK, 90% of our seagrass has been lost. Um, and that's predominantly due to a wasting disease that's happened, but recreational activities such as boating um, are causing disturbance as well, along with um, nutrient runoff from the land um, and changes along our coastline. But we have a duty of care to make sure that we're minimizing our contribution to that impact. Um, the other great thing about seagrass, it is a nursery habitat for all sorts of an array of species from fish that we eat on our plates um, to key species that um, help the whole entire ecosystem to survive. They also have a root system, a bit like grass at home, that binds the sand together. And that helps stabilize our coastlines and protect it from coastal erosion. Um, and the actual root system stores carbon um, as well as the actual fronds. 
So it has so many benefits um, that this is why a lot of focus is going on in this area. Let me just give you an idea of what's going on beneath the hull of our vessel. So we go into a place to anchor. We, you know, we dock our anchor down. Lovely. Look at the beautiful scenery. Look at the beach. Look at the trees growing on, you know. Now, that whole ecosystem you're all admiring there, it all works together. And a lot of it you can't see. It's out of sight, out of mind. But when you put an anchor down, if you look on the right hand side here, if you have anchor drag, that anchor can rip through a seabed habitat and uproot. So here it's uprooting seagrass, but it might be another type of habitat, it might be coral as well, or reef systems. Um, this is damaging. If we have lots of boats in one area, it's repetitive damage over time and it's, and it's um, dotted around in one area. That doesn't lead to a healthy habitat and a full ecosystem there for that particular species. So not only have we got the anchor, we've got the chain. So on the left-hand side here, we have the chain which allows the weight for our anchors to hook into the seabed to stabilize us and to stop the dragging of the anchor. But the chain itself will rise and fall and it will slacken and it will tighten. Now, when it's loose, some of the fronds of any vegetation on the seabed will get caught between the chains. And then when it tightens, as the boat pulls away, it will rip those fronds. The other thing is, um, as we know, um, the boat will shift around the anchor points depending on the tide and the wind change. And as that happens, that chain will start pivoting around and abrading the seabed. And what we find is we get these kind of dead zones um, where the habitat it, it cannot grow. Um, where you can really see this is actually mooring systems. So our traditional moorings that we moor up to. So if you're not going to anchor, um, there are moorings. But the problem again with these is they're still going to be pivoting if it's a swing um, mooring. And you can see on the left hand side here where we've got um, abrasion area where that chain has worn away that seagrass. So we've got a, a dead zone there. And the picture on the right hand side here, I don't know if anyone can guess where this is taken. Put it, put it in the chat, put it in the chat and um, I'll find out in a minute. So in this particular site, I'm going to tell you, um, you can see here the dark patches are seagrass. And where you've got the mooring systems, you can see these circular patches. That is where the abrasion of the chain. So it's better than anchoring because we're not anchoring in fresh areas, but our um, traditional mooring systems are still not fantastic. So how can we make these better? And that's why I mentioned earlier, we're designing these to lift the chain off the seabed with floats or removing the chain completely where you have an elastic um, riser which takes the tension out of the bow. So usually it's the chain that does that, but with these new mooring systems, um, they stretch. Um, and there's lots of information on the Greenbury website about that for more. Anyone put any guesses in for the location? We haven't no. got anyone. No one's gone for it. <laughs> no, it's I not didn't. like, um, usually it's quite turquoise and bright um, in this location, but... It is the Isles of Scilly and it is St Mary's Bay. So that's um, a group of islands off the southwest of the English coastline. So just to give you reinforce this message, when you're out um, and a lot of you will probably be visiting Koja, there might not be any moorings and your only option might be to anchor. But let me just show you here to demonstrate the impact of the amount of chain that you might be putting out. And I know we're always really tempted to put out a couple of extra meters just to make sure our boat's secure, but this is a difference and impact it can make. So the diagram here is showing you in the purple, six meters of chain that's lying on the seabed. Now, if that did a full pivot circle around the anchor, which is on the seabed, it has the potential to abrade 113 meters squared of habitat. Now, as boaters, oh, you know, if you're the skipper, you might say to your crew, oh, just let out an extra couple, you know, just want to be safe, you know, secure. Couple of extra, eight metres. Suddenly it goes up to 201 metres squared just by adding those two extra metres on, nearly double the area of that circle. So these small changes we can make as boat users in making sure we're accurately using the minimum amount of chain possible to secure our vessel is really, really important and using the right anchor. I know with this, you're, you're not, with the anchor, you're gonna have to deal with the anchor that's on board with the boat that you're chartering. But um, in terms of chain length, this is something that you can have control over. Um, 
If you want to find out information, we've got this guide, guide here. There's a QR code, so you can scan it on your phones now if you've got them ready. Um, you can download this guide and it's absolutely free. It's on the Green Blue website under our resource section. Um, there will be some links being added into the chat to take you directly to our green guide section on the website. And we've got some other guides in there that you might be interested in. So just to clarify with this, one, you wanna locate where sensitive sea bed areas are. So you can choose your anchorage with care. If you're in a spot where you can actually visually see the habitat through the water and it's not all murky and muddy, then you can choose to lay your anchor and you make sure your chain is feeding out away from those habitats. We're working with Imre Navionics um, and Savvy Navi to have the seagrass layers put on our nautical charts to make it easier for you as boat users to see where these seagrass habitats are. Second, anchor away from them, like I said, um, or more. Use an advanced mooring system if there's one available. Um, and if there isn't, then you're gonna have to use your traditional. And then, like I said, if the only option is to anchor, avoid chain drag, keep your chain to an absolute minimum. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd just like to um, to remind to all of the people on the on the um, attending, sorry, this webinar. Um, any of our clients that book uh, with Globe Sailor, you, we offer you a premium uh, access to some of those apps that um, you could use for um, locating these these areas. Please make sure to use these apps as it will help uh, prevent further damages to um to the seabed so uh please do uh give it a go feel free to reach out to us if you need any assistance on how to how to use them um and uh we'll be happy to help yeah so i know definitely savvy navi have got them for the uk and some european areas um they're still adding some and navionics and imre um we're working with them currently to get that on so it's not on their charts yet but that's coming so it's exciting Thank you so much, Kate. Um, always a pleasure listening. I was able to, um, for, for the attendees, I was able to hear um, her panel on safe anchoring already. So I'm still learning more um, every time you speak. So thank you so much. Um, can you tell us a bit more about um, invasive species now and how um, sailors can prevent the spread of invasive species when um, transitioning between different waterways? Yeah, uh, so this is um, uh, another big issue that the Green Blues kind of been campaigning on quite, quite a few years now, because um, in the UK, we've got um, inland lakes and waterways, and a lot of invasive species end up getting introduced to these naturally, but also through human. But if you're not familiar with what an invasive species is, essentially, you have non-native species. They're species that are brought into a new area that they haven't um, developed in or existed in before. Um, and a lot of those will live in harmony with the wildlife and ecosystem and they don't cause any harm. So they're just called non-native. Unfortunately, some of those species, be it plants or animals, will become invasive. And when they're given that definition, it's because they're either bringing in a disease, they're out competing other plants for space and light, um, or it might be um, animals for food, again, space to live. And a lot of these invasive species um, grow very rapidly and they absolutely smother and cover everything. So in the picture here, you can see um, a fender. Um, and this happens to boats as well, especially if they're left in the water and not looked after. Um, and here you can see trumpet tube worm, which is an invasive species in the UK, um, but it's very sharp, prickly. And actually that can be quite, one, quite dangerous for us um, touching it, but it also scrape along the sides of our boats. But you can see how much it completely smothers and a lot of these species do this. In terms of boating, we like to put anti-foul on the bottom of our boats to prevent biofouling. Um, and, and that helps to prevent the, these species spreading from one water body to another because it means that they can't attach and stay there. But you will always find some that still, especially the small algae initially, um, so there's always a risk of transmitting these from one place to another, and we still got um, something we can do about that. Um, there's just a variety of different species you can see down the bottom here. They have some great names. They do have Latin names. Uh, they've got Pacific Oyster, which a lot of you might be familiar with. Um, it has a kind of frilly skirt edge to it. In the UK, our native oysters have a nice smooth edge to the oyster. So that's one way you can tell. Um, but they outcompete our native oysters. 
So they kind of, they dominate. You've got other things like Darwin's Barnacle, um, Tufty Buff, I love that name, um, and Trumpet Tube Worm. And there's this horrible one called Carpet Sea Square. And it, it, the reason it's called Carpet is because it does just absolutely carpet everything, but the smell of it is absolutely horrendous. Um, the thing is with a lot of these, they like man-made objects. So ponti pontoons, marinas, hulls of vessels, our equipment. Um, and therefore we need to be able to remove them somehow before we leave one site and go to another. So when you're out on your vessel and you either you have anchored or you visited a place, the first thing you need to do is check, can you visibly see any biofouling on your vessel, be it the fenders, be it the rope that's gone into the water? I mean, the best thing is try and avoid any equipment being submerged because these aquatic invasive species will attach. Um, and if you can see it visually, remove it and put it into a waste burn and put it into a general waste. So um, you don't know if you picked it up in that location or whether you picked it up before somewhere. And it might be a risk of you just removing it and dropping it into the water. Um, if you've gone anchoring and you pour, uh, pulled up the anchor and there's some fouling on it, please try and remove any of the fouling you can see on there. But if you follow my advice and you haven't anchored in um, a lovely, beautiful habitat, hopefully there won't be any green fronds dangling off your anchor when you when you um, bring it in but um, this gentleman here is leaning over having a scrubbing brush cleaning it off um, it is ideal yes it's putting the species back in the water but if you've anchored there then they're already there um, it just means you're not then going to go to another bay and cove and then deploy that anchor and then essentially spread that species the next thing once you've got rid of the uh, visual stuff is try and clean and clean with fresh water this can be very difficult if you're out in a remote area but if you're a marina trying to um, clean that off, if you're, especially if you're bringing a vessel on board or if you've got a stand-up paddleboard uh, on board your vessel. Um, so I know um, when I was sailing out in Australia, we have a stand-up paddleboard um, on the boat. And when we bring it back in, we use the water to wash it down. Because when we go to another site and then we put the paddleboard in, it's going to start um, transferring that. And I think that's where the difficult thing is with the smaller craft is you can transport them around a lot more easily. Um, we just need to make sure we're washing them. Um, with the boats, um, you can see it's gentlemen going along here, cleaning um, along the water line, getting rid of that kind of algae growth. The best thing you can do is just um, clean as often as you can. Stop it getting to that stage where there's barnacles growing on there. Um, and if it is horrendous, if you've got your own vessel at home, if it gets really bad and you've left it over the winter, um, you, you need to pull that out and remove it. Um, safely on shore and dispose of that material or biofouling. The last thing is dry. These species are aquatic invasive species that I'm talking about. They like to survive in damp conditions and they will for several weeks. So any nooks and crannies, keeping those dry and UV light as well. So exposing them to UV light, the air naturally dry. Think about your clothing as well, your boots, your trailer wheels, all of that cleaning, making sure it's dry. It is probably impossible to get everything, but as long as we do these, it's minimizing the risk. So, so that's the important thing to take on board there. Um, and you can see in the picture in the bottom right hand side here, keeping your fenders out of the water, not dragging in the water and your ropes and everything else, it stops them attaching. Some very interesting uh, uh, pieces of advice here, Kate. Thank you very much for this. Um, moving on, we're a little bit behind on schedule, but we'll we'll try and make it uh, uh, make it last uh, within the hour. So, um, what what are some of the uh, effective practices that uh, sailors can adopt uh, to minimise the waste uh, while sailing on holiday to reduce their environmental footprint um, overall? Yep. Um, the first thing we've with anything with waste, there's a hierarchy. So this is the waste hierarchy you can see here in this kind of upside down um, pyramid. Um, we automatically go to recycle, that's the solution. Um, there's a few steps before that. So the first thing is just refuse, avoid, reduce what you're purchasing. Um, going back to what I was saying before, can you borrow and rent things? Can you get things secondhand um, instead of um, buying brand new things? Um, and also, if there are things that do get damaged, try and repair those, because then that's bringing it back into the system. And whoever's lending you that, that coat, or if you've gone to um, a secondhand shop or online one, 
um, it's going back into the circle and therefore new products aren't being developed and then people aren't chucking them away to go to landfill as well. Um, and then if it is recycled, like I said, there are options for different, different things that you can do now for sale cloth, um, even recycling of rope. Some companies are accepting rope back now, such as English braids, Marlow ropes. Um, and that means because it's their own rope, they can put that back in, melt it down and create the plastic yarn again to create new rope. So that's fantastic. And just making sure you're looking after things, making sure they're prolonged. Don't leave ropes and things out in UV light um, where they can degrade over time. Protecting your equipment um, is really, really important. Um, and trying, trying to buy things from recycled polyester and look for organic fair trade cotton and bamboo. Um, bamboo regrows quickly um, and the main, the main part of the plant stays where it is. So you're not completely cutting it down and removing it. Um, so that, that's why it's more sustainable. Um, and have things that you can reuse on board, reusable water bottles. I know I've been on some vessels where you've got just lines of water bottles lined up in, in the boat. One, it's taking up loads of space. Um, and once you're done with that, it gets thrown away. If you're on a charter company and they give you a whole batch of single-use plastic bottles to have on board, please say something about it. Um, stick up for what you believe in and say, I do not want this. Having a large container that you can fill with water and then decanter that into a reusable um, bottle instead is a great idea. I know that some countries, the infrastructure is not there in terms of recycling and it is really frustrating. Um, and I understand that, but if you're, if you're visiting a place, then please take your own containers. And these days you can get these ones that can pack down. Um, so it's great to put in your luggage. Um, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, so this is an example of our, um, a, a couple who are ambassadors, George and Sinead. So on their vessel, they've got bags underneath. And actually, I think that what they've done now is they've got these boxes where they're separating out their waste from recycling, general waste and compost. The, the Tupperware box you can see on the navigation table here, that's their compost box. And they say it's fantastic because you don't have all the smelly food in with the general waste and you can empty it more regularly on shore. Um, and it's all sealed up as well. So they, they really, um, they love that aspect. And if you are in a country where you can do composting, and I don't think really there's enough in terms of marinas providing this facility. Um, and, and I know that um, you might be able to go and ask a restaurant if you can put it into their composting facilities, or if you know a local resident um, using their household ones as well. Um, so in terms of um, food, there's also ways you can minimise your waste. So I would have recipes pre-planned. Um, and this means that anyone coming on board can have those recipes. You can get the set food and one night one person might be cooking and another and you're not having to separate that out and everyone knows what they're doing. Um, and that allows you to minimise that kind of waste of food and people doubling up buying the same things. Um, try and um, use less meat. Again, like I said before, with cooking, the grease, the fats aren't great. Um, it's going to uh, make your boat smell as well. And by eating less meat, you're going to have less carbon emissions, so more plant-based. Um, and, and of course, you won't have that smell in the bins afterwards that meat gives you when, it, when it's um, going off, not, not particularly pleasant. Uh, the picture on the right-hand side here, you've got these Tupperware boxes and they will pack down. So if you're trying to take something away with you, Having these Tupperware boxes where you can put leftovers in, store them to then eat the next day rather than just chucking all that food waste out is a great idea. You can reuse the food for lunch the next day or take it out on a picnic. Um, and, and again, if you've got less meat in there, it's also going to be more healthy. Um, but these are great things for storage if, you, if, you, if you're taking away and also just storing on your boat to pack away. Um, and you may want to consider that for your waste bins um, and, and your compost. Um, yeah, so that's that's it for me from that one. Thank, thank you so much, Kate. Um, we had quite a few questions about um, if you don't bring bottled water on, what can you do? I know you touched on um, having the water tank that you can refill from. Um, a couple of folks had asked about um, a water filter. Do you know if there's some that you can take on and off the boat if you are chartering quite regularly? Um, in I know there's um, water filters that you can install into the vessels um underneath and you can get the water filled taps and in terms of portable ones that you can take on and then start fixing in remotely i'm not sure about that um that's an interesting one though that could be an, a new interesting device um we have 
a company called Wavestream that produce all sorts of filter systems for bilge pumps to filter out the oil and the microplastics before you pump your bilge water out, water filters, grey water filters as well. So going back to those cleaning products, there is devices you can install on board which will clean that water out. And so if you desperately can't get rid of that wonderful shampoo you love, then, then maybe installing one of these. But if you're on a charter holiday, you're restricted. It's up to the charter companies. And again, this is where having your power as a customer to recommend things would be great. And potentially in the future, I think the Green Blue could look at maybe doing a kind of certification for charter companies around what their green credentials are to, to better help customers go, OK, they're doing this, but they're not doing that. Um, as a bit of guidance so so maybe in the future watch this space um, and hopefully that will help you you better in terms of um, water if you're not bringing your own bottles and you have to go and purchase it um, locally I mean see what's on board to begin with but go for a larger water bottle okay and then if you can buy a reusable one or use cups on board instead of bottles but obviously if you're out for the day you want something that's going to be a bit more sealed something you can decanter into but have that larger one rather than lots and lots and lots of little plastic bottles because there's more plastic that makes up that if that makes sense well if some some of our attendees are engineers or entrepreneurs and they want to come up with a solution feel <laughs> free to to hit us up and we'll be we'll be happy to mention it in our future webinars with uh with kate <laughs> yeah i'm all for that so, i mean there's a lot of things that you can change in your behavior as a boat user but you will hit a barrier where the products or the facilities aren't available so if solutions and technology can come up or marinas can start putting in more facilities to help us as boaters, then, you know, absolutely key. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, our last question today is just how um, we can promote um, a sailor sustainability and environmentally friendly practices in the community. Yeah. So this is an opportunity to share with you our Green Blue Boating Pledge. So essentially, this is a pledge that any boat user can take. Um, and it's a pledge to respect, protect, and enjoy the waters, the habitats, and wildlife we share our boating environment with. Now, the pledge has in it very simple environmental best practice that any boat user can adopt. Depending on what kind of boating you do, some, some of the points will be relevant, but others not. But most of them on there will be relevant if you're a yacht sailor or motor yacht sailor. So um, what I would recommend is please use a QR code at the top there to make your pledge. Um, and in the bottom there, there's also the URL. Um, but the other thing around this, we're trying to get as many boat users as possible to make the pledge. Number one, because it tells us how many boaters out there are taking the environment seriously to them that are passionate about this. Number two, it's showing us who are our ambassadors out in our sailing community, who are um, interested in this. And we want to hear about your stories and what you're doing on board. And I've already seen in the chat, people already putting their own suggestions of things they're doing already, which is fantastic. And, and that means I'm always learning as well, because um, someone's probably doing something really good on their boat that, that we've not heard of. And the third reason is if we can get as many people taking this pledge as possible, we can build up a number to go to industry, to go to the people that are providing the products, to go to the charter companies and say, these are your customers. They've made this pledge. It is important to them to do these things. So things in the pledge, please, do, please use the QR code and visit to see the contents of it. But just to give you examples, it's um, you know, not anchoring in habitat areas where possible, using eco-friendly cleaning products on board, um, making sure that we're minimizing disturbance to wildlife, it's all things that anyone can adopt. It's not things that are going to cost you lots of money. It's the, these are the key things to follow. And then the rest of it um, that might cost a little bit money or a bit more decision, then, then that's up to you. And, and we have information on the Green Blue website to help you with that. But this is just a nice, straightforward guide for you. Um, but please, please do that because the more we can get, the more we, data we've got to then go, right, this is this is the boating community this is what we want um and and let's make change and action happen thank you very much i'd like to also extend uh the fact that obviously this is not just for uh, uk based but worldwide clients feel free to 
um, come in and uh, help us um, grow this uh, sustainable practice with everyone. Um, and um, and hopefully this will become the norm for, for the future generations of, um, of sailors. Um, thank you, Kate, very much for all of this very interesting information. Um, I was wondering if any of you would have any questions for us. Um, I see quite a few people asking if we would be able to share this presentation. We will be sending this through our newsletter um, in the next 24 hours. Uh, feel free to share with everyone or your friends and family. Um, we, um, we would be very happy also to answer any questions. You can write to Globe Sailor, you can write to Kate, um, and um, even, if you can't, even if you can't think of any um, questions right now, you can always uh, reach out to us and we'll be happy to help. Um, so, Kate, we have a first question um, uh, from Christina uh, asking whether um, the apps you mentioned um, do cover the um, seagrass area um, in the coastlines in the UK and, uh, well, worldwide. Um, yeah, so like I said before, um, Sabi Navi has seagrass layers on there for UK and some parts of Europe, but they're calling on environmental organisations based in countries that survey where seagrass is. For us, it's the Wildlife Trust in the UK and Natural England. Um, and, you know, there's a bit of a shout out here for anyone that's um, got connections in those areas um, who survey the seabed, get that data, because essentially we need the shape files to then put onto the GIS systems that get put onto our software. In terms of Navionics and Imre, we're working very closely with them at the moment and providing them initially with the UK data, but then we'll be going wider afield um, um, to source more. I hope this answers the question, Christina. Um, uh, we have another question um, coming back to the question of uh, containing the waste. Um, is there any suggestion on how to uh, prevent uh, smells uh, from ruining the experience on board if you're off uh, for a few days and you're not actually going to come back to shore are there any techniques that you can think of um, to yeah prevent um, uh, sewage uh, smells coming up the drains okay um so yeah in terms of that there's always going to be a degree of smell there are cleaning products I again use the enzymes um, which which can be used and that will help freshen the smell up um, again if you're on a charter holiday you don't have much decision over the type of toilet or heads that are being used on board some people use compost toilets they don't smell as much um, um, and then it's a case of um, yeah if it is holding tanks there are things that you can put in there and there are eco-friendly options so please do go on the green blue business directory there's free companies providing different things there um, and and we will be populating more of those um, and then the other things um, are use onshore toilets as much as possible, like I said before, um, and, and that that will help reduce. But yes, if you're if you're in a remote area for a while, um, then there will always be a degree, especially if you're using salt salt water to flush through your system. Thank thank you thank you, Kate. For if not, get a nose peg. <laughs> you do get used to it after a while. I just um, returned from sailing on um, Friday, and I will say that um, the smell just goes away after a while. So <laughs> it's about the experience. <laughs> um yeah. we, we have uh we have another question about um well i'm guessing um this must be part of uh, the list that you can provide. Um Sorry. Um, yes. Yeah, so could you um, or do you have any um, brands that you can suggest uh, for compressing bins? Um, uh, what kind of technique do they use? Is it vacuum? Is it is it crushing? Do you have any details on this? Um, is that for, like crushing hands on board? Uh, all the, the the waste, the waste, the disposable waste that you store on board in order for it to take less space and and um, and you know have a bit more uh, autonomy and not have to come back to shore um, yeah. too regularly. I think I think also look at your packaging. Try and buy things with not loads of packaging on, and maybe when you're on shore, remove that packaging and dispose of it before heading out um, and putting it into your Tupperware boxes that can be reused um, and. 
and then at least you've left that on shore it's probably going to facilities and obviously recycle as much as you possibly can and when you're purchasing food try and purchase food that doesn't have all that packaging around it especially plastic packaging um if you can go to local local um farm stores um or local produce usually they're not wrapped in lots of things um and also it's better for the environment if you're purchasing more locally um on board again um with the compost it's the tupperware um like um our ambassadors are using closing off you don't you don't get the smell there um and and it's keeping it in one area um and then crushing i, I think you can get can crushers so if you need, I mean, you can deal with your feet, but if you're looking for the more tin ones, there are small hand ones that you can do. If you're thinking um, larger scale or compost, I know there was companies, uh, a, a company who was looking at installing um, compost type waste facilities on shore where you can put it in and it compacts it down. But that won't help you in terms of storage on board. The, the concertina um, type um, boxes are really good. So once you know, obviously, if it's full, it's full, and then you need to empty it, but at least you can compress it down um, and it will save you space as well. So, things that can flatten down and open out, like the bins you have in your car, <laughs> the little small ones, they're flattened out. You can store them, transport them really well, and then you can pop them out when you need them, put them away, um, and store. Very interesting. Very interesting. Kate, we have one final question and then and then um, and then we'll let everyone uh, go. Uh, we have David Robinson here asking, you know, uh, you mentioned before the um, the fact that you'd like to have some sort of certification for uh, eco friendly companies um, that, you know, have good practices in terms of uh, minimizing their environmental impact. Um, would you have a um, what do you have it already or would you are you planning on um, also having a list of marinas that have the facilities um, and um, a sort of create a sort of guides that um, our clients and anyone sailing can use when they are in, in an area so that they can go to these marinas that have the infrastructure in place so that they can use uh, those um, those uh, eco practices um, when sailing. Yeah, so the first one, product-wise, I mean, we've got the Green Blue Business Directory, we asked for third-party accreditation because we're not professionals in assessing. Obviously, some products, will they may not be made out of sustainable material, but their purpose, like solar panels, will be helping boat users to decarbonise. Um, so we do have that, but we don't have a separate accreditation for accrediting all these different types of products. It's, it's very complex, so we look for third-party accreditations that may be accrediting in that specific area of those kind of products that are being made. Um, if it's FSC for paper, um, forest, you know, forestry um, side of things, and we look for those kind of stamps uh, as anyone would. Um, in terms of the marinas um, and knowing the facilities, um, in uh, Australasia side of things, um, and in Europe, um, you'll have either the Marine Industry Association or the Yacht Harbour Association, and they run something, one called the Gold Anchor Scheme, which gives gold anchors to certain marinas. And within there, there is environmental credentials embedded, which the Green Blue was part of in the past. Um, but then we felt it, there was a need for an environmental accreditation. And now there's something called the Clean Marina Program, which is run. And so I'd recommend looking out and asking marinas if they have the Clean Marina accreditation. So strict environmental accreditation. Um, and an assessor goes in and assesses at their meeting, one, the legal requirements, because a lot of marinas aren't even meeting that, and then going above and beyond. So things in that might be they have a pump out um, facility, they have recycling on shore, they have a filtered bundled wash down to collect anti foul residue. The other thing um, that we do have is, and it is just UK based at the moment, it's our environmental facilities map on our website. Um, and what we've done there is we've listed all these different um, facilities, such as yeah, recycling, electric charging points for cars, boats, um, hazardous waste disposal, flare disposal, all these things. And it's on an interactive map and you click on the thing you're looking for as a boat user and it will bring up dots all across the UK for this one to show you which marinas have these. And that will help you decide, you know, which marinas have most of these facilities, who's doing best. In terms of full accreditation, clean marina program, but we need more marinas signing up to it um, and, and getting it. <laughs> um, but that that exists, if that helps. But hopefully we can expand the environmental map a little bit further. 
we um uh, our, our colleagues have put some useful links in the chat um as well as um the attendees so feel free to check them out um and uh and yeah if you want to know more feel free to um uh follow the qr code here um you can also visit the green blue website as we've mentioned before um or you can sign up to the newsletter write to us um both globe sailor and the green blue we're all on instagram facebook etc you can find all of our details on there um sophie and yes, we, we just want to say thank you so much to everyone for joining. Um, you will receive a link within the next 24 hours to this recording. So you can watch it again. Um, you can share it with your friends and family. Um, we would love that. And uh, just a big, big thank you to Kate um, for spending the time and, and educating all of us on um, responsible sailing. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it and you'll take at least one thing away and, and action it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, everyone, for attending and um, see you soon for another webinar. Take care. Bye. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.